Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session here at Embedded Linux Conference. Uh, my name is Tim Bird. I'm a principal software engineer for uh, Sony Electronics. I'm here with Harish Bansal, who's a technical engineer with TimeSys, and we are here to talk to you about embedded board farm APIs. So we want to talk about something we think will be really beneficial for uh, automated testing and the improvement of the testing ecosystem. So. Um, Next slide, Harish. So the I always like to put the abstract in, but we're going to skip over that. Uh, that's for people who look at the slides afterwards and maybe don't have access to the video. Our agenda today is uh, I'm going to talk about kind of the problem statement. Why are we talking about uh, board farm APIs? Uh, and then we'll give a little bit of an introduction to uh, embedded board farm cloud, which is a development solution by TimeSys. Uh, and then we'll talk about some actual use cases for the REST API, uh, give some details about the API, and then wrap it up by talking about issues encountered and what's next. So uh, getting started with the problem statement. Uh, so there are lots of tests that are available, um, but the basic problem is that there's no standardized way of running tests uh, specifically on physical devices. So there are lots of different test frameworks um, and uh, there are uh, lots of, uh, there are board farm frameworks. Uh, there are certainly tools available to manage board farms and uh, to manage the hardware that's in, that's in a farm, but there's no standardized way to access uh, those, uh, that, that software or that framework so that different test frameworks and different tests can run in a lab independent way. Uh, the real big issue here is that every farm implements test infrastructure differently. So, for instance, um, you know, Harish is going to present some information about the TimeSys board farm and uh, the hardware that they've got in their lab, uh, which is what we use to run our prototype on. I've got a board farm sitting here right next to me. Uh, it's off camera, but uh, it's uh, if you've ever run a board farm, you know that it's uh, it's got a tangled mess of wires. I've got all kinds of custom hardware in there. Uh, I've got some off-the-shelf pieces for doing power control, and I've got a I've got a custom board for doing power measurement, and and so the tests that are written in my lab that control that hardware are not going to run in someone else's lab, and vice versa. So um, QA departments for companies will write tests that will work in their lab with their particular infrastructure, uh, but it doesn't work in someone else's lab, and so we can't share tests with each other. And uh, in, since we're dealing with open source software, it seems like a real shame uh, that we can't, can't reuse each other's work. So our solution is we want to create a standard method for accessing board farm. Um, and we think that what that will allow is for three big benefits. One of the first benefits is once you have that abstraction layer, uh, you'll be able to um, allow the test infrastructure, the technologies uh, to evolve separately from the interface. So um, for instance, I've got a certain type of power measurement uh, board in my farm, uh, but if other labs have different power measurement boards, they can evolve separately and introduce new features or, or handle things in a different way. So the tests are not tied to a particular implementation uh, or expression in hardware. Um, the, the big benefit is that tests can be written to work in more than one lab, and that, that allows us to create an ecosystem of tests rather than just have tests that are that are written by, uh, by one company or one individual. Uh, the other thing that it allows is for test frameworks that can work uh, also with more than one lab. And we're actually going to demonstrate that working uh, today. So the types of tests we're talking about are not just pure software tests. We're really talking about uh, hardware software integration tests or end-to-end -end tests. So if you look at, for instance, if you were to do GPIO testing or serial, serial port testing on a board, you could accomplish that by uh, putting the serial port in loopback mode and testing both endpoints on the same device. But that's, that's not really how uh, the hardware is going to be tested uh, or going to be used in the field. If you have a product that has a GPIO, uh, you want to test it all the way through the hardware um, and out to an external device so that you can capture things like not just uh, device driver errors, but things like uh, mechanical failures or uh, electrical failures that are part of that product. And that's very common to want to do that. So for all of these 
types of hardware, kind of integrated hardware software tests, you actually end up having to control two endpoints. You have to control an endpoint on the device, and then you have to control an endpoint that is off the device. And so I use the acronym uh, DUT here, which is DUT. I'll, I'll say DUT a lot, which is the device under test. So if you look at another example of maybe a hardware software integration test, uh, you have audio playback, which uh, or, or video playback. Uh, again, you need to control two endpoints. You have an endpoint on the board that is actually generating the audio uh, or managing it in some way. And then you have an endpoint off the board, which is a capture device to make sure that you're, you're not getting any dropouts or, uh, or time delays or uh, that the quality is what you're expecting. Um, and so again, you're controlling two endpoints. The same with power measurement. If you're doing power measurement off the board, uh, you're going to control two endpoints. One is on the board where you're uh, actually managing the uh, workload profile uh, that you're trying to test or the application. And then off the device, you're talking to some kind of board or measurement device uh, that actually is taking power readings. And you want to analyze those after the test to see what happened in terms of maxes or total power used or something. Um, and then another test that you can imagine is uh, what we do at Sony is USB connect and disconnect testing to make sure that we have a robust uh, error handling. Uh, and that's both kind of at the electrical level and for the stack, the driver level. Uh, again, you need to control two endpoints, one on the board and one off the board. Um, and so you will usually have hardware that disconnects and reconnects the bus. But those are not the only uh, hardware, hardware software is not the only type of testing that can benefit from what I call de multi-device orchestration. So if you look at something uh, like NetPerf, um, where you need to manage two endpoints. So you have a client uh, on the board itself that is going to be generating network traffic. And you have a server that's going to be receiving traffic or measuring the performance of the traffic. Um, you, you may want to, well, at a minimum, you need to discover the server address. And that's going to be specific to the lab. Um, so you need to, the test itself needs to know what the address of the NetPerf server is. But uh, um, you also, there also may be configurations where you want to make that NetPerf server um, specific uh, to a particular set of nodes so that uh, you can reduce the amount of uh, traffic collisions and, and make the test results more consistent. So you may need the lab management software to actually reserve the NetPerf server for a period of time um, and release it instead of just having it generally available uh, that introduces uh, inconsistencies in the test data. Another type of multi-device orchestration that is common that we don't actually think of as multi-device orchestration because we've been doing it so long is a boot test. Uh, in this case, you may need to manage several different devices. Um, well, you always have to manage several different devices. The, the classic boot test is, uh, you know, you need to install a kernel in the root FS somewhere and that, that requires access to a storage controller. Uh, it, it, in the case of SD card based boards, you may want an SD muxer uh, that you're communicating with to actually accomplish that. Uh, and then you have a serial controller that's actually capturing the serial line uh, where you're getting the console output. And then you have a power controller to control the power to the board. So uh, historically, we haven't think, thought of tests in that uh, way um, as you know, controlling multiple endpoints, but that's really what's going on under the hood. So our concept today that we want to introduce you is um, uh, this REST API. And the REST API will, will create an abstraction layer that any test framework can talk to and a test can talk to to uh, communicate with hardware and resources or, or features that are inside a lab uh, for a particular test and do it in a way that it doesn't matter which farm you're talking to the same operations can be performed, the same data can be gathered, and so the test can be farm neutral. Uh, drilling down a little bit deeper uh, into the, the diagram here. Um, next slide, Harish. Yeah, so we have, uh, if you look at what the API is actually controlling, uh, you have some operations or some actions that are controlling the board in the lab uh, and but you also have operations that control those other endpoints that I was talking about. So you might have a power controller, uh, you might have an audio video capture device or a GPIO endpoint. 
Um, and those are all things that the REST API can manage for you in a lab independent fashion. And so the frameworks can access them in a lab independent fashion, but also the test itself that is actually running on the board can also uh, communicate with or control uh, those other resources. So that's the overall concept. Um, and our REST API uh, really consists of kind of three parts uh, that I think are important. First, you know, you have the REST API itself, a command line interface and environment variables. So the REST API is actually a very kind of traditional uh, web API. It's based on HTTP, HTTPS with uh, URIs that include actions and objects and uh, JSON is passed back and forth uh, between the client and the server. Uh, we actually did this as an extension to the Lava REST API, so it should be pretty familiar. Um, and if you and a lot of frameworks already have plumbing uh, to deal with that Lava REST API already. Uh, it's a very simple API uh, in terms of uh, the amount of dependencies it has on external programs. So you can actually uh, accomplish everything you need to with this API using just curl and uh, JQ. JQ is a, a Linux command line tool for uh, extracting data. Um, individual elements from JSON data. Um, so that's the actual API. That's the kind of the most important thing. But we also provide a command line tool so that you have, uh, it has the same operations as the REST API. And uh, it is suitable for automated use. You can, if your test framework does things more with the command line and shell scripting, uh, it's a little bit easier to use with that. But it's also much easier for humans to use instead of crafting these uh, long URLs that have uh, a very specific syntax, you can, uh, you can use a command line tool. Uh, it's a little bit more comfortable. And then the final aspect of the API is that there are some things that need to be communicated to the test program uh, before it even has access to the uh, API itself. So for one example, the, the address of the server where the, that is managing the lab. So uh, some of those environment variables are some of those, uh, some of that data is passed as environment variables, um, or it can be put in a file called uh, Etsy test config. So those are the elements of the API. And uh, now I'll turn the time over to Harish to talk a little bit about the hardware that we used for the prototype implementation. Uh, thank you, Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Harish Bansal and I work for Embedded Boat Form team at Timesys. So let me give you a brief introduction to, of Timesys Embedded Boat Form Cloud. This is the high level diagram of uh, embedded boat form cloud using this solution engineers who are sitting anywhere across the world, but they are connected to this uh, cloud, they could access any remote boat or embedded device and use it for their development and testing. These ports at their physical locations in lab, uh, they are connected to a specialized hardware called zombies. Uh, these zombies with board, these could be distributed across different geographical locations, different countries, different buildings, or different floors of the uh, of, of a same building. And all these zombies with boards, they communicate with us a uh, centralized server, which we call embedded board form master, EBF master. And engineers connect to this EBF master to access the remote uh, board uh, and embedded board form cloud features. This embedded board from cloud master, it's a Linux machine which controls all the zombies which are on the cloud and the devices connected to it. Uh, it runs a web application inside a Docker container which provides centralized board management, uh, user management, zombie management, image and file transfer management. It has also integrated a uh, Lava test framework. So on any of the device which is connected to any of the zombie, you could use it for running automated tests. On the right is the picture of uh, actual uh, zombie hardware. Uh, it's divided into two parts. Uh, one uh, on the left is a zombie section uh, for embedded board form feature. And on the right is an app or a test server uh, uh, p uh, part, which is used for testing and uh, streaming. The box on, on the left, uh, the, uh, the part under a uh, red box, uh, this is a uh, zombie part. Uh, here uh, devices, serial ports are connected at the top and it has ethernet ports for uh, bringing the devices onto the network. Uh, on the right uh, one under blue box is the app or test server uh, section. It, it 
runs Linux, and this code acts as a additional lab machine for running uh, tests like uh, iperf or netperf, which require additional uh, uh, endpoint in the lab infrastructure. Uh, there are ports where you could connect uh, peripherals like uh, JTAG for debugging your hardware or connect a webcam to see live images of, uh, of your board, embedded board or DUT. On the bottom left is another lab controller. Uh, this is called Input Output Controller, IOCX. Uh, it's an optional uh, hardware which uh, sits between a zombie and device. Uh, so each zombie could connect up to four devices and with each device, one IOCX is connected. Uh, on top of IOCX, there is a mounted uh, power relay switch. Uh, through this, you could control, uh, one could control board's power. Uh, then it has USB and Ethernet hot plugs. Uh, these hot plugs are like switches. So many a time uh, one needs to uh, on-demand connect or disconnect peripherals from, from the DUTs or boards. So uh, those actual uh, peripherals are connected on these hot plugs and then using a web UI of embedded board form or REST API, you could on, one could on-demand connect those uh, to the device site or remove it. For boards uh, which boots out of uh, SD card or use SD card as one of the boot media, there is SD mux built in. So this uh, notch with the ribbon cable, it goes into the SD card slot of the embedded device or board. And the actual SD card is connected at the back uh, of this IOCX1, which is highlighted with the red box. And then uh, remotely, you could switch uh, the SD card to the device side or switch it to the zombie side. So the, once it switched to the zombie side, you could manage the SD card content, format the SD card, create different partition, upload or download files from the SD card or flash a new uh, uh, device image to the SD card. Uh, then it has uh, I square C and GPIO connector, which I'm going to talk about in later slides. This is a device dashboard of uh, the web user interface. Uh, here you could see all the devices uh, or boards which are connected across the uh, embedded board form, uh, which board is connected to which uh, uh, zombie, what's the uh, board or device status, who is currently using it. And if any uh, device is free, you could assign the device to yourself and start using it. Once you... Uh, assign the device to yourself, you get access to the device console. Uh, it, you get access to the device serial console. If the device supports uh, is running a SSH server, you could access SSH console. And if it's an Android device, you could even uh, access its ADB console. Uh, if device is in hang state or uh, it's powered off, uh, uh, then uh, we could uh, one, one could use this power commands, uh, power control off or on reboot. Uh, the commands which you see, it depends on which uh, power, uh, remote control power switch are you using. Uh, the one at the top, of, uh, it's not necessary uh, that you could, you should use the one which is at the top of IOCX. Uh, with uh, time series board form, you could connect any I remote control power switch, whether it's a IP control, SNMP control, or relay control. And uh, the commands which that power switch uh, supports, those show up here. So the, the commands could be like off with delay, uh, on with delay, A plus, B plus, whatever that power supply, uh, power remote power switch supports. Uh, you could turn on streaming. You could see video streaming or audio and audio streaming. Uh, one could do SD card or network boot image management. On uh, the device, uh, page uh, at the top, there is a menu, uh, we call it IOCX menu. Uh, so here STMUX uh, device screen shows uh, the SD card, which is actually physically connected at the back of, back of IOCX. It's on the device side. Uh, SD card, uh, if it's red, that means uh, the SD card is connected on the zombie side and it's ready for, uh, uh, for you to manage the SD card content. Uh, on the right, uh, of this SD mux are hot plug uh, buttons. Red means off, uh, means disconnected. Greens means they are connected back. So Tim is going to discuss in detail GPIO uh, tests. So let me uh, describe uh, GPIO setup in times uh, in the board form. So at the left bottom is IOCX. Uh, 
this uh, IOCX has eight GPO, GPIO lines, which could be connected to uh, the DUT or device. And uh, so out of these eight, the six pairs of line ground comes out of this GPIO connector and two lines comes out of uh, this I square C uh, connector. And all these GPIO lines could be controlled using uh, REST APIs. So let me go ahead and uh, now describe a prototype use case. Uh, keeping in mind the uh, GPIO hardware capabilities in the embedded board farm cloud, um, we designed a test to test GPIO on the board. Uh, and uh, we're using the REST API. And what we're going to show in our prototype use case is a couple of different things. Uh, we're using uh, from both uh, the TimeSys uh, web UI, you can access features on the board and perform the test, and you can actually run it as a lava job, uh, and you can uh, use Fuego to also uh, in initiate that same job and perform the test. Uh, one of the things that we didn't quite finish, uh, but that is pretty close, is uh, also running that test in the Sony embedded board farm uh, we're pretty confident that it would work, but uh, uh, TimeSys did a better job of finishing up their implementation than I did. Uh, so, but um, looking at how uh, the test is actually going to run, uh, uh, so uh, we're going to show you a couple of different things uh, in a video coming up. Uh, so you can run the run these tests or use the API uh, in several different ways. So you can do manual execution. So if you want to get onto the board and actually issue the GPIO commands yourself or uh, access the lab resource yourself, you can do that manually uh, through the command line tool um, or through the console uh, that's available. Uh, you can run a test script, which basically does those same types of commands, uh, except using uh, the REST API directly from the script. And that's, uh, you'll see, uh, and you can run that test manually or the next, the next phase is to put it under test automation. So uh, we will show you um, a test uh, running from a lava job and then from uh, Fuego. Uh, and and that, in, uh, that puts the test encapsulated in kind of the larger test framework that uh, does things like uh, uh, schedules the job and uh, presents the results at the end. So um, with that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at what we did, so. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, here uh, in this video, we are showing three different ways of uh, running our GPIO test script. Uh, this is first example of uh, running the test script using a device web console. Uh, so we logged in into Board from Cloud's web interface on the device dashboard. We are searching for a device. Uh, we allocated the device. Now we are going to the console page. So device console page, here we are uh, straight into the directory which had the test, executed the test and we could see test ran uh, and it uh, printed out the test result. This is a second example of running the same test through a command line tool. So EBF is the name of the tool. My devices command list give list of all the devices which are currently assigned to this user. Uh, this with this next command, we are going to run execute some command on on the board. So this EPF tool, uh, uh, you could install it on your machine, and uh, once installed, you could access any remote board. So this video was prepared by uh, my uh, fellow engineer Ankit Gupta. So he installed uh, this EPF tool on his system. Uh, so from his system, uh, which is physically in Delhi, he's running command on this Raspberry Pi board, which is connected to a zombie in Pittsburgh in uh, US, in our US office. So if any first ran ls minus al command to see whether the test script exists, now uh, he's running the actual test script using ssh run command on this Raspberry 4 GPIO board. It's executing on the server, on, on the board, and it fetched uh, the test script output, and we could see directly on, our, on, on the local machine. This is a third example. This should be interesting. Uh, so, so far, uh, we sh uh, showed you manual way. So now we are going to run the same GPIO test uh, 
through a test framework lava uh, for this we curated a lava test job pre -cu uh, curated it uh, we are going to submit that uh, manual test job yaml so here we copied it this is uh, the gpio test we are going to run we want to run it on a raspberry pi 4 device type submit lava job and it assigned a Raspberry 4 GPIO device for the test job. It's running. You could see test job locks coming on the screen. Yeah, close to come. It's done. We could see same uh, test uh, script output uh, in the test job lock. And if we go to Lava result, we see GPIO test passed. Okay. So now for this next section, uh, this was from uh, the Jenkins interface. Uh, so Fuego uses Jenkins as its uh, user interface. And we can see that I've defined some tests uh, that are uh, part of the Fuego infrastructure. I'm going to do a, a, a Jenkins build, which is the same thing as a, a test execution. And so I'm using uh, the, same, the same REST API uh, to perform some operations with the board. Uh, Fuego does the test in a series of fa phases. Uh, the pretest phase is where we check connectivity and do some, some basic uh, board sanity checks. Uh, then we're actually going to uh, deploy the test to the board and execute it, and we'll get some uh, results back. I think it's important to note that um, I do not have SSH access between my lab and uh, the zombie. I'm using the REST API. So this is, uh, there's SSH between the zombie and the board, uh, but these are all operations that are going purely through the REST API. So there's no direct connection between, between the labs. Um, and you don't have to open up holes in your, uh, in your network uh, in order to let stuff through. Anyway, this is showing that the test passed. Uh, everything worked great. And so that's it. Uh, we're, we're uh, so it was a short demo, but uh, we're pretty excited. There was a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, over the last couple months to, to get that all working. And uh, so uh, we think that this heralds the, the dawn of a new age of uh, remote testing uh, for automated, uh, for embedded Linux. So. Uh, now I'll let uh, Harish, I think he's going to talk a little bit more about the API details. Thank you. Uh, so let's get uh, under the hood and see how it's working. Uh, here is the actual uh, GPIO REST API. So it consists of uh, GPIO command, GPIO pin pattern, and GPIO pin data in the URI itself. Uh, currently, it supports eight different GPIO commands, uh, four for bit mode, uh, read, write, get mode, and set mode, and four commands for mask, read mask, write mask, get mode mask, and set mode mask. GPIO pin pattern, uh, it's lab dependent. Uh, so in our case, our, uh, this IOCX controller uh, uh, has eight GPIO uh, lines. So lab pin numbers varies from one to eight and pattern mask varies from 1 to 255 uh, in decimal. Uh, GPI open data, again, it's uh, lab dependent. Uh, this API, it returns uh, output uh, in JSON, a JSON object uh, result uh, with value success and uh, data value would depend on what command you run, uh, uh, GPIO command you run. Uh, in case uh, the command uh, fails on the server, it returns a result as fail and why it failed, uh, that re uh, failure reason comes under message. This is a section of actual uh, GPIO test script. Uh, here it, uh, uh, GPIO uh, de uh, device, uh, G uh, GPIO pin 20 was connected uh, to lab controllers pin number six. It sets the pin high on the device, and then uh, using the REST API, it fetches the uh, uh, value of lab controller GPI open. Then it does a match between the two. If the value matches, test case passed. Uh, it equals OK for the test description. In case there is a no match, test case fails, and it equals not OK with test description. 
uh, embedded board from uh, command line tool, EPF tool, uh, which uh, uh, we showed uh, in the demo. It's uh, implemented using the REST API. Uh, it could be used for automation or interactive manual use. And all the uh, EPF uh, CLI commands, they are uh, uh, purely using the REST API. So in, uh, in this, uh, uh, I have listed some of the commands and you could see how these commands are directly mapped uh, with the REST APIs. Okay, so now I think I'd like to go to a wrap up and tell you a little bit about uh, some of the issues we encountered and uh, some of the next steps. So a couple of things that I think are uh, we encountered that were interesting uh, in terms of creating this API. I think it's important to note uh, that kind of different parts of the test framework and the test uh, use different parts of the API. And so um, that's, that's uh, useful information because it helps you understand uh, what parts of the API uh, kind of are, are needed by, by different sections of uh, the overall CI loop. So for instance, the test framework is going to do use uh, actions like run, upload, and download. Uh, but the, in, in our case, the GPIO test itself used uh, things that were dedicated, that were kind of targeted at a particular resource in the lab, hardware resource, things to do set direction, read, and write. Uh, different frameworks put control of operations in different places. So it's important to kind of separate them out and understand uh, which parts of the API are being used by which parts of uh, the different test frameworks. Uh, one of the things we did uh, determined that uh, is that we need to extend the API a little bit. Um, there's predefined data that is lab independent that you can kind of uh, put on put into the test without having to worry about it. But there's also discovered data. So in our example, uh, we have um, a GPIO endpoint on the board and a GPIO endpoint in the lab, and uh, you really need to discover. Uh, the mapping between those two. So we don't actually in the API right there, the, the demo we had today, uh, we hard coded those, but uh, those are gonna be different uh, per lab because of it depends on the wiring that, it, that you've done as you've set up the hardware in your lab. So uh, we're learning the types of things that we're gonna have to uh, do to extend the API to cover use cases and make the test truly uh, lab independent. Uh, the other thing that we discovered is just impedance mismatch between the expectations of uh, different test frameworks. So uh, as an example, uh, the way that the test operates in the, um, in the TimeSys lab, uh, they only needed a single file to be copied over. Uh, Fuego, so a lot of Fuego tests use a recursive file copy. Uh, currently, the REST API only supports that single file, and we're able to work around, around that. Uh, but uh, we want to look and see what are the actual requirements from the different uh, test frameworks and how they operate and continue to refine the API. And then the last thing is you need to integrate all of this with your larger CI loop. So there are actions that you perform on your boards, uh, provisioning the board um, and getting stuff set up that you also need to take into account. So what's next? So we've demonstrated the basic concept and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, but uh, we, need to, we need to go to the next step, create APIs for other lab resource types. So we're pretty sure that it's, um, that it's not an endless uh, task ahead of us. Uh, there's a lot of resources. We did a simple end-to-end -end task where we're just controlling two endpoints with basically ones or zeros and some directions. Uh, uh, for other types of lab equipment, you're going to need different APIs. But we think that a lot of the types of things you're going to be doing with the lab equipment is going to be generalizable. Uh, you're going to be able to generalize it to just a couple of simple commands. So for instance, for power management, audio capture, and video capture, you're going to need a verb for start capture, end capture, and then get that log. Um, now the actual, so obviously audio capture and power measurement return different types of logs. Uh, but we don't think that the API has to actually deal uh, it, with the specifics of the la of the kind of the log type. Uh, but we may, we may decide differently. So we uh, we may decide to include some resource specific type actions to support. So for instance, in power management, instead of just returning git log and having the framework or the test analyze the log, uh, we may introduce a verb like git max power. Uh, where the driver for your power measurement device can analyze the log for you and, and return a single number that, that has meaning for the test. But 
overall, we need to run a bunch of different tests and see what issues crop up. Um, the important thing and the reason we're here today is we want to convince other labs and frameworks to adopt this API. That's how we're going to uh, get to a place where we can have an ecosystem of tests that we're all sharing with each other. And so we'd like to profit from that ecosystem, start sharing tests the same way that we're sharing uh, open source code. We'd like to be able to share open source uh, testing artifacts, uh, the tests themselves, the results, and all that. And we think that uh, this is a, a way to start. With all of this type of stuff, uh, you have a chicken and egg problem. Someone's got to go first. No, you, that's fine, Rish. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we know that uh, people are not going to want to write tests until the, the labs have this in their farms, and people are not going to want to put this in their farms until people have written tests. But someone's got to take a first step, and we feel like uh, we've, we've got a good start on this. Uh, there, there are schema definitions and other materials related to this project uh, that uh, are going to, into this repository here, then GitHub. And we are very excited uh, to have people give us feedback. If you want to join the lab, uh, join, join this effort, um, please communicate with any of us. And um, we would love to get additional labs, especially of different types uh, of hardware uh, involved and uh, try to do some testing to make sure that we're covering everybody's use cases. And with that, uh, we'll thank you for your time and we'll move on to some comments. So any, any questions or comments?